Hello, hello. Can you? Ah, good morning. Good morning, Eric. Ah, he's the man. He knows. Good morning. Uh, and good morning, Melita. She's the woman. She knows. I'm starting off in such a gendered way. But yes, they know. Ah, good morning, Anjali. All right, here we go. Now we're going. And here comes Claudia. Hold on a second. So, yes, good morning, Eric. Good morning, Melita. Good morning, Anjali. Uh, good morning. Uh, oh, and here, uh, good morning, uh, good morning, Jonathan. All right, now we are really. I don't think we did this routine back when Jonathan was. Why well, don't think we had Zoom when Jonathan? Oh, anyway, good morning, Claudia. All right, here we are. We have a quorum. All right, we will get going in a second. Good morning. All right. Um, wait for a couple. Thank you all again, as usual, for being so flexible with all this. Uh, this was not planned, obviously, and I. Oh, and I, yes. Uh, okay, we're going to get started in a second. And unfortunately, yes, so I'm not there. That's why I'm here. Thank you for being so flexible. But it does mean, to be clear, it does mean I'm literally not there or um, on campus. So I don't, I can't do office hours today. So if you still have questions or concerns uh, regarding the exam or anything else, like when we're done with this, um today uh email me or text me and we'll see if we can work something out particularly for say thursday <laughs> if you wanted to talk excuse me <clears throat> okay but so you're all here or all of you who are here are here so um the deal let me just see the chat okay oh, more people are coming okay but we right so the reason we're here well is because it's class time but my whole point, because I guess I made clear in the Google Classroom, the whole point, I, you know what, in a way, this is like um, uh, video group version of office hours, put it that way. Like, it's, I mean, I, I, I believe me, I've got things that I can say, and I will, if nothing else um, comes up. But anything that I say today will be about the exam. This is all to try to give you a la us a last opportunity to get anything together that we want to for the exam. Let me, um, so I hope you do treat this sort of like a group office hours. I mean, in the set, not that you should go away or or that I should, but that, um, you know, the more of your specific concerns that I can address in the next hour and uh, 15 minutes is the better. I'll even tell you, um, oh, you should know that I did this same thing in the other section yesterday. So I'll try to remember to put the recording of their class in your Google Classroom, but either way, it, it is on YouTube, obviously. Um, so, you know, if they ask questions that are different from the ones that you're about to ask or whatever, you should maybe check that out as well. Uh, so, so this is all about the exam. That's the bottom line. It's all about the exam. And for sure, um, um, the more questions you have and the more specific that they are, the more of them I can answer efficiently, you know, in an hour and 15 minutes. The one thing I'll say is it seems, I think it goes, I hope you do have questions of any kind. Again, and the narrower there, you know, if you just say, can you go over the first two problems, you know, like if no one else asks anything else, I mean, I could, but th th but given that there's already two videos posted and given how loquacious I can be, it's, it's probably not the best use of your time if I just start talking and talking about really broad things. So, you know, again, the more that you can find or have found or have questions like, wait, in part B over here, you said on the video that the solution had a negative sign, but I don't understand where the negative sign is coming from or something like that. Those would be the best type of questions to get. And um, in a way, I'm just going to babble until I get them. I will suggest that you put them in direct chat. That did seem to go better for, uh, I mean, A, for your own so that you don't have to worry, you know, so, so really there's no stupid questions today that and you can know that if you put it in the direct chat first of all i can prioritize i can do quicker ones first but also then if there's something really really off base about your question i'll write you that in direct chat and you don't have to worry about you know a misuse of time or anything like that um 
So I will take, so I would love to receive questions from you at any time from here on in, in the direct chat about the midterm, particularly the practice midterm, particularly the solutions to it, particularly either of the, ah, okay. I see a question in the direct chat and that is pretty specific. It's one part. Okay. Actually, fair enough. Yes. All right. I see a question. Right, I'll, I'll read out loud. I, I, and I, because I, I was just about to stall further. All right. So the question in the chat is, can we do question three, part six, please? Yeah, that's very fair. I'll say, so yes, the answer is yes. I'll get to that. Like, I'll do that. Let me give a little background and say, first of all, I would say that's probably one of the hardest questions in the whole exam. I mean, that's very fair that she would ask about that or, or he, sorry, that someone would ask about that. Um, 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 it's partly hard. All oh, question three. So, so let me give you a little bit of background quickly on question three in general, but yes, part six, I will, I will go straight to in a moment. Question three is partly hard because it takes the concepts from lecture and apply some of the concepts that you've already would have done in problems one and two and applies them to, you know, an example that you only know from lab, right? So already that that's tricky. It, it, um, it's the concepts of a mass on a spring applied to the uh, example of a pendulum on a string. Warning about aspects of that problem, like in part four and five, it does, it does require you to sort of remember or recall or review certain fundamental aspects of physics 203 or physics one. Um, and that's not, that's just the reality of the physics works like that. You just can't do the physics without the fundamentals. So that makes it a little tricky too. I'm going to say right now before I get, and part six, yes, is the heart of the whole thing in a way or the hardest part. The first video I posted, someone pointed out the other, the first video I posted with a walkthrough of solutions, it just races through problem three at the end. So it really stands to reason that people would be concerned about problem three. But the other video I just posted last night, I did so on purpose because it does, a, I think, a much more thorough job of walking through problem three in general. So I would suggest, so, and maybe people might not have had time yet to see that, but just so you know whatever I'm about to say now, if I leave something out or you want another perspective, I think the second video I posted really examines part three. Um, finally, I'm going to say the overview aspects of part three, I also talked about in yesterday's class and the other videos. So I will right now, I'm going to assume you can look at any of those resources to figure out the overall picture of part three, of problem three, particularly, um, uh, you know, the first three or four parts, but then, okay, part six. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to do that right now. In fact, let me, yes. So, okay. So we're doing, and I would put it on the screen, except I've got the solutions right here. So, so we're, so this is stuff I'll post all this is stuff on other aspects of the exam. I'll post all of this, of course, but part problem three. Okay. So here we are at problem three. Also, I'm going to put up on my screen. Pardon me for a second. Anyway, let me just make clear. I, like, is everybody? So I'm about to talk about problem three, part six, um, of the practice exam. Can can everybody? Since I know we're it's early in the morning, so a lot of people are not doing video. I totally understand that. Could you just raise your electronic hand if you're still with me and you know that I'm about to do problem three, part six? Uh -huh. Okay, that's a little concerning. Wait, raise your electronic hand if you're with me at all. If you hear me, if you're with me, raise your like. Okay, thank you, Andra. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's a good start. Okay, that's good. Okay, thank you. All it's right. Not with, it's not letting me raise my hand, but on my video. Oh, that okay. Wow, that was voice. All right, the points for voice. Okay, cool, good, good. Okay, all right. So you all went. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. So we're talking problem three. Part, and I'm about to do, and part six is a part I'll try to do in detail right now. Little background. Part, the other thing, the reason that part three is confusing, problem three is confusing is at the beginning, you're present, so quick walk through here. At the beginning of the whole problem, you're presented with the differential equation and, and asked to figure things out just from the differential equation that you're assuming 
that you've been told applies to this pendulum. So the beginning of the whole problem, right? Parts one and two and I think three, um, they are very much like problem one of the whole exam. Like we're just trying to get used to the idea that once you see that that, that type of differential equation applies to a system, then that means the system's a harmonic oscillator. And it means that the system oscillates with an angular frequency, which is the square root of the constant in the differential equation, right? So at the beginning, you're doing really, really the same thing that you do in problem one of the whole exam. In problem one, the variable is C. In this problem, the variable is theta, but you're doing the same type of math. Um, again, I'm gonna pause for a second. I highly encourage, when I post the video from the other class, I, I highly encourage you to check that out too at some point when you're doing the exam or studying because I give a lot of details of exactly what I'm expecting, like how much information you should give me like in problem one or in the beginning of problem three, like how much you can assume that we already know and how much you can't, like things like that. If people don't ask today or if I don't get to them, I really spell that out in detail, like, like literally how much you have to show. I give examples of that in the other, okay, anyway. So assuming you've already walked through, assuming you've already solved like parts one and two and three, and you're dealing with this pendulum like it's an oscillator. So you're taking the square root of the constant to get the angular frequency. And, okay, one thing that I say in the other video, and you've already by this point, by the time you get to the end of the problem, you've already given not only the free body diagram that it explicitly asks for, but you've made your own picture even before you started the problem, like you're doing the five-step method. So you make your own picture of the pendulum before you even get to the question where it asks for a free body diagram. It's just like a little, little pro tip here. You make your own picture fully labeled of the situation, showing me what direction the string is hanging in. Like, are you having it hang to the right? Or are you having it hang to the left? Totally up to you. But then once you make that picture and you label everything, then when you go to make your free body diagram, I can see whether the free body diagram is consistent with the forces are pointing in the correct direction for your picture, right? So you've done, so that's just, again, pro tip. If, you, if I said that too fast, watch the video, but you have already drawn at least two pictures by this point. Then you get to part five. Now, again, the direct chat person's asking about six, but let me just say one last thing about, by the time you get to five in problem three, it's now asking you to back up and show why we believe in that differential equation in the first place. So part five is now asking you to do old physics, like physics 203, like forces and stuff, F net equals MA, to actually derive the differential equation in the first place. So it's having you step back. So we're not, so now we're showing. So that's what it says on this page right here. We're showing why we believe from classical mechanics, we're showing why we believe that theta oscillates um, cosinusoidally in time, at, in time, right? So by five, we've shown this differential equation is true. And we've literally found out in part five that the constant omega, the angular frequency, is the square root of, of G over the length of the string. Okay, so that's... That, that's where we are by the time we head into six. Now we go to part six. Okay. And this was all, this page right here is like showing you how to get five. This is all, you'll see when you get these notes uploaded, this is all about how to do five. Okay. I'm just going to make it clear for five. So this is all for part five, just like hints. It's not a full solution, but it's just, oh, okay. This is how you do five. Where's it? I'm trying. Okay. And now we get to six. Hello, hello. Okay. Okay. Six is asking. It's in effect, it's asking us to solve for V at the equilibrium position, I'm just scrolling to it. It's asking us to solve for the instantaneous speed
Okay, yeah. It wants find V at T equals T over four. So that means, well, that means a quarter of the way through a, a full period, right? A quarter cycle. A full period is all the way there from one amplitude position all the way to the other amplitude position and back. Like a full cycle is there and back. So our half cycle is all the way there. So a quarter cycle means to the equilibrium position. So we're trying to find V at equilibrium, which is to say at theta equals zero. That's what we're trying to find. Right now, the catch is um, hold on one second. Oh, yeah. oh the, the wording is a little weird. Yeah, okay. This is a hard question anyway, but then it is even a little bit more confusing because the wording is a little bit. Oh, too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. The wording is, and I think in the practice exam, or certainly in the exam, I'll give you the wording gets better. Um, the wording is okay. We, yeah, we're trying to find the speed at the equilibrium position, but we're trying to find it by two different methods and show that they both. Get the same answer? Yeah. Two different methods for same answer. One, and that's what we're gonna do right now. Like I will walk through this because this is one thing, whatever, it's worth it, I think. I think it's a good question. But by the way, while I'm doing this, especially if I start taking too long, like I, like again, like I think of all the questions to do, th this is a good one. Um, but please feel free to keep questions coming in the direct chat while I'm doing this, because I'll just, you know me, I'm just going to keep talking, like unless there's something else to get to. So feel free in the direct chat to say, okay, when you're done, can you do blah, 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 or whatever. And that will also hurry me up. Um, so we're trying to find speed at equilibrium two different ways. But there's this weird thing that it mentions about G in the middle of the question, which is confusing. It says... Note. It says something about how you can find your finding for G. Well, it says according to your finding in five above, and that's very confusing. I've never known because the V looks like it might mean velocity. It means the V, it means five above, question five above. So it's saying, according to what you did in question five above, when you proved that the pendulum was a harmonic oscillator, determine the value for G at the location this pendulum swings. Okay, so evidently this is something you're supposed to do first before you even get um, values uh, for the instantaneous speed. Now, why would you even have to do that? Like, what's that about? Isn't G normally 9.8? Yes, G is 9.8 at the surface of the earth. Something that it says in some copies of the, some, I'm not sure how it says it in this particular version of the exam, but it often tries in the exam to make it clear to you from the beginning that you might just be near the surface of the earth or you might be somewhere in a tunnel underneath the earth or you, or some versions of this exam say that you're like you're on another planet or something. I'm telling you right now, one of the benefits of even being in class today is you should come, if you get a problem like this on your exam, which you probably will, um, you should go in assuming, or you should go in expecting that you can't assume that G is 9.8. You can't, it will tell you one way or another, or it'll try to tell you that you're not necessarily at the surface of the earth. All the physics that everything you're doing here is the same as all physics, but we're not necessarily at the surface of the earth. We don't necessarily, we don't know the value for free fall acceleration when we begin this problem. The, um, the, 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 re the reason for that is if you really understand a pendulum and you really do part five properly and you prove that a pendulum is a harmonic oscillator, one of the great benefits of that is that gives us the ability to find out what G is in the first place. In fact, like that's what Galileo did, among other things. In other words, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying... To start off, 
we can say from the above section of this problem, we have shown that the, um, that the uh, angular uh, frequency of this oscillator is determined by these parameters. Like we have shown this in the part above, right? I.e., it's not a memorizer, it's not a given. It's not, I mean, that's really what we're trying to say is you don't know that just automatically, but you've now shown that it's true, just like you show that omega equals square root of K over M, you know, in other parts of the exam. Here, we've now shown that this is an oscillator whose frequency is square is determined by these parameters, G and L, in this way, right? So now that we've shown that, And since we know, right, that th this is a harmonic, we know the differential equation. We've just shown it and it was given to us. We know the differential equation looks like this. Right, so from all of our work with simple harmonic oscillators, the work you just did in part five, the work that you do to prove things in problem one of the exam, you know that the angular frequency of an oscillator is the square root of the constant in the differential equation. So we know that omega, right, we know is the square root of pi squared over 36. So we know, sorry, that omega is um, pi over six radians per second, right? We know, um, tell me if you want me to go back. I will in a second, I'm just writing this before I forget, but I can go back in a second. So we know that omega is like a base. Oh, I forgot my kind of, it's like 0.577 or something like that. I think it's point, hold on. Let me, well, yeah. Uh, and again, this part you would have done already in part two. So I'm basically help. This is a review of part two of the problem as well. But. Point five two. Okay. So, so we know in part, from part two, that omega is approximately 0.524 radians per second. Well, now we've just shown that omega has to be the square root of G over L. So therefore, square both sides, omega squared equals G over L. So G equals um, omega squared L. So, so G on this planet, or this in this place, approximately equals 0.524 squared times, and I forget the L of the O6. Um, so, uh, I think I would have remembered these answers. And tell me if I, these answers are actually not familiar to me, but um, so maybe I'm doing something wrong, but let me know. Um, so I think, so I actually, so first of all, Right. What I'm saying so far to answer like sort of the first part of this part is apparently we're in a place on Earth or sort of in the Earth or on some other planet where um, the acceleration due to gravity is a lot lower than 9.8. It's um, it's like a sixth. Of so actually, this is almost this is a little bit like the moon or something. The gravity is um, like a sixth of what it normally is. Now, um. And it's badly written in this problem. I will be clear on your exam. It says at the top of this problem, somewhere near the Earth's surface. That's like a really, that's a bad word. That doesn't tell you anything. It's trying to say that it's not at the Earth's surface. Um, yeah, I, I would still go. I still haven't answered the question yet. But one thing you might be noticing, especially if you haven't thought about this problem before or whatever, notice all of this is sort of in the background. 
This is meant to discourage you, or in fact, forbid you from doing part two the wrong way. Like if I weren't telling you all this right now, or you hadn't thought this all through, or you weren't totally on top of the situation, what some people sometimes do, or if you're not paying attention, what some people sometimes do on this exam is when they get to part two and it asks for the angular frequency, they just go, oh, they just have memorized already for a pendulum that um, omega equals square root of G over L. So when they go to part two, they just go, oh, well, G is 9.8 and L is six. So I'm just going to get omega that way. This is trying to make sure that you don't do that because we haven't shown that that's true at that point. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for saying good morning. Good morning. Awesome. All right. So again, I'm still not finished doing this and I'm going to keep doing this until someone else asks me a different question. But just to start off part six of problem three, first thing is you actually have to show what G little g is and it's fair to not assume that it's 9.8 and therefore you can't and you and so don't you anyway uh, tell me if that's not clear in the chat but so we have the gene now. now what we're supposed to do now we're supposed to use this value of g to find v at theta equals zero two different ways and again, the great thing about you all being here right now is I, yes, I, the person who asked for this problem, like, I, I honestly think if you can really follow everything I'm doing here, I think, I think it is the most challenging part of the exam in a way. So two different ways. And they're going to show that the answers and, and, and cross check, like show that the answers um, match. Okay. So what are the two different ways? Okay. Uh, something's in the chat. So uh, I'm going to say this and I'm going to look in the chat. Method way, number one is trying to bring you back to homework 1B, to question four of homework 1B. Um, so method one, in short, I, I see there's something in the chat. I will look in a second. Method one is use energy conservation because no, and because I want you to notice this is the same question, even though it doesn't look Quite, you know, homework one was a mass going back and forth on a spring. This is a bob go swing back and forth on a pendulum. But in question four of homework 1B, we asked how fast is the mass going when it reaches the equilibrium position, when it gets to the middle? Like we, we know it starts out over here at rest, and then we figure out a bunch of things and it moves into the middle. And we, and we ask how fast is it going when it gets to the middle? We're asking the same question here. How fast is the pendulum bob going by the time it gets to the equilibrium position? So the method we're going to do is the same thing as saying, is the same thing. We're going to say total mechanical energy is conserved. That's method one I'm going to do. Let me just make sure of what's going on in the chat. Hold on a second. Oh, oh. Yeah. Wait, okay, okay, right, 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 right. This So again, this question is legitimately hard, period. But then there are also wording issues that are not helping. Um, so someone's asking in the chat, what did I say that V was again? Did I mean that it means part five? Yeah, well, yeah, it's being used two different ways. That's a confusing thing. Right here on this board, when I say use G to find V, what I mean is here, is we're trying to find the instantaneous speed, velocity, but we, but I don't. But the direction is obvious. I'm trying to find the magnitude of the velocity at theta equals zero. So I do. I mean velocity. Instantaneous. Speed. I mean, tip. Oh, okay. That answers it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. So that's what we're solving for. So again, like we solved um, in uh, part four of question one. So we're going to use energy conservation now. 
like if I were doing, and I do think if I were keeping track of the five-step method here, which hopefully I do in the walkthrough videos, we're up to step three now. I should give a general definition or principle, right? The general definition or principle, if you look back to question four of homework 1B, um, is something like this. Okay, so, there's, so first of all, my GDP is energy is conserved for this system. We're gonna do energy conservation. Now I will make a note to you, but from like a test taking perspective, from the perspective of this kind of exam, there is a lot that I expect you to explain at this point. Um, a lot of stuff that I'm, I'm gonna to get to it and show you how to use energy conservation here. Cause I, I think that's what you wanna see. But so, so, but I should alert you At this point in the exam, Point number one, that's tricky. Again, I, mean, I don't want to overdwell, but here's what I'm looking for on this exam. Or here's an example. Like in this problem, you're now going to say all the forces, uh, you're going to say energy is going to be conserved here. Energy is conserved when all the forces doing work on a system are conservative. But we spent a long time on this topic at the beginning of the semester, and it's an important topic. So you're now going to break down and show me that you understand, first of all, why it is that we believe all the forces doing work on this system are conservative? When I say you're going to explain, I mean like in some degree of English and maybe some degree of pictures or something. Like you don't have to write 50 pages, but you make it clear to me that the forces here, okay, I, I'm going to give you a hint right now that the forces here are gravity. The, the forces from your free body diagram, like you look up to your pure FBD that you drew in part two, and this is part of the or part one, and this is part of the reason we asked you to do it. You drew a pure free body diagram in part one. It had two forces in it, tension and gravity. You're now going to say, okay, well, those are the forces, tension and gravity. Gravity is a conservative force. You're going to tell me that. And then you're going to actually stop and point out, again, this is like the big pro tip for anybody who's like still paying attention right now. These are the kinds of things I look for. You're then going to point out that tension is not conservative. Tension is not conservative. Like, it's, but it's not doing any work. You're going to think about this. Like, remember, go back to the definition of work. 
work as a dot product to do work on something. You have to exert a force that has some kind of component parallel to the displacement. And so this is a subtlety here, but any single point that this pendulum bob is swinging down in its arc, it's moving, it's velocitizing along a tangent line and the tension is along a radius. The tension is always exerting a force on this bob, always exerting a force. But that force is always perpendicular to the displacement of the bob. So the force is there, but it's not doing any work. That is, it's it's accelerating, it's changing direction of the bob, it's centripetal, but it's not changing the speed of the bob. It's not delivering any energy to the bob ever. It's not doing any work because it's always perpendicular to the bob. Now that's sort of a sidebar I'm saying right now, but it's not a sidebar because that's the kind of thing I look for in these exams is like explanations like that. So first, so I'm telling you right now, first of all, it doesn't have to be long, but acknowledge all the forces doing work on this thing are conservative because even though there is a non-conservative force acting on it, that non-conservative force is not doing work. By the way, like what is a conservative force? You'll tell me quickly, Something like this. I'm not, again, I'm not going to over, and you're going to do your words or whatever, but this, all of the, what I'm saying right now in brief is this is your, again, he or she who asked about this question, definitely pick the right one. Because this is the one moment in the whole exam where I get to find out whether what you absorbed from all of that energy discussion that took us like, I think a double period um, you know, with the integrals and the closed path integrals and all that stuff that we actually need for electricity later, right? It seemed like one small, but that whole subtopic, like the, the rubber of that hits the road right here. So any, the more you could show me that you understand that the definition of a conservative force is one whose path integral around a closed path, whose closed path integral is zero, you'll so. Yeah, okay, wait, I just saw something good in the direct chat. Hold on, Sue, yeah. The answer is correct, you're correct. I'll read that to everybody in a minute. Um, so, okay, so, okay, and I don't mean to, I know this is like a lot, um, <laughs> no problem. Um, but uh, to be honest, somebody in the other class, or just to be thorough, <laughs> somebody in the other class, they asked about how to do question one, problem one, right? And so I do a little bit of a walkthrough of that in the other video, blah, blah. But part of their point, their very good question was like, when you start off question one, problem one, like basically if you just know that the square root of the constant in part one, problem one, like if you just know that the square root is the angular frequency, like you can do it in like one step, but are you asking us to like go back and derive like to totally show why we know all of that? Are you asking us to go back and, derive like the cosine equation and show that it is the solution to the differential equation and all that. And are you asking us to show all the stuff with energy and path integrals and everything? And what I said to that person, and again, if you watch the video is, I'm always asking you to show far more rather than far less. When in doubt, if there's anything in your mind that seems relevant at all, show it, yes. Now specifically in part one, but once you show it once, you don't have to show it twice. You can always refer back to it. So problem one, part one, is where you're going to really go to town and show all that cosine stuff and take two derivatives and all that. In part one, problem one, since it's the beginning of the exam, and I don't know what you know yet, and you don't, you know, we haven't established anything yet, you go to town and show all the, take derivatives of cosines and show why cosines work for, you know, and literally derive the differential equation from F equals negative KX. Again, that's in the other video. But, but you don't have to do any of the energy stuff there because you're not anything about energy at any point in part one. So here's where you do the energy stuff. Okay, so I'll get back to the topic. Now. So here you sidebar, you do some stuff and you say, okay, uh, when a, a conservative force is de by definition this, there's one conservative force doing work in this problem. Oh, and someone asked in the chat, oh, oh sorry. And I will, okay. Oh, oh, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So a couple of people, so a couple of things in the chat. First of all, just to confirm. So one thing I'm saying is you define what a conservative force is. You say when all forces doing work are conservative, then uh, then energy is concerned, conserved. 
you say tension is a force, but it's not doing work. And so here's the direct chat thing. So someone asked me to confirm, wait, is MG not doing work because it is perpendicular? That's correct. MG is not doing, oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, not MG. Oh, wait, wait, that's not correct. Sorry, sorry. MG totally is doing work. MG is doing work. MG, in fact, is the only force doing work on this pendulum. MG at any moment, at any moment, I don't want to, at any moment, MG is pointing in a way that has some component parallel to the displacement of this pendulum bob. Like the pendulum bob is like falling, falling always at an angle and the angle is always changing. Like right, if you were at the side of the arc, it's falling straight down. And then it's angling, 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 angling. Like the angle keeps changing. The angle keeps changing until, you know, until the bottom when the angle is, the angle of its motion is totally horizontal. I'm saying the way the pendulum bob is always moving is along a tangent line. If you were to cut the string at any moment, the way that the bob would instantaneously fall off is is the, along the tangent line that's the way that's the direction of its displacement in any moment i'm saying that no, i'm saying no matter which way it's going the tension in the string is always perpendicular to that the radius of the string is always perpendicular to the tangent to the line that is tangent to the arc at the string. So I'm saying MG does do work, but the tension never does work because the tension's always perpendicular. And you might, okay, that's one question. It, a perpendicular to the displacement. And I'm saying, what I'm saying is, in all this, I'm saying our original definition of work, our original definition of work, is the integral of the dot product between force and displacement. Now, don't worry about, don't worry about the integral piece for a second, for a moment. But just remember, or go back to your old notes or whatever, realize, and this is, again, here's the one point in the exam where you would say something about this. We made a big stink that about dot products versus cross products and all that. Work is a dot product between force and displacement. That literally means, so I'm still in the, okay. everything I'm saying right now is in the context of backing up and explaining what energy conservation means and how it applies to this pendulum, which again, I'm asking you to do as the exam taker. Um, so what right now I'm saying is work by definition is a dot product of force with displacement. And dot product by definition means this means the magnitude of one vector. So, so the dot product of force with displacement means the magnitude of force times the magnitude of displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. And the whole cosine thing is there to measure, uh, measure parallelism. Right, because the cosine of zero is one and the cosine of 90 degrees is zero, right? So, so okay, so, so I'm saying in general about work, work, a force only does work when it has some component of parallelism with the displacement. Tension does not, tension's always perpendicular with the displacement, so it's never doing any work in this situation. What does that mean in English? Does that mean it's not a force? No, it is a force. Does that mean it does not accelerate? It does accelerate, but it doesn't do work. It doesn't deliver energy. So it doesn't change speed. What the tension is doing is doing the only other kind of form of acceleration we know. It's changing direction. It's this, so it's gravity that's responsible for making this thing go faster and faster as it falls down. It's the string that's responsible for making it not fall straight down. 
if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, so, so that's on that question, but the person asked like, and hopefully that's sort of, they'll tell me later whether that's clear or not. So, and again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you're going to write five pages on this, but you're going to acknowledge, you got to think, all of you have to think of your whole exam as a proof. Really, well, the best way to think of it is as a presentation. Think of your whole exam as like a, like a conference, a paper or a poster that you're bringing to a conference. You're not trying to give me the answers. I already know the answers and I know that you know the answers because they're all over the web and all of that. You're trying to derive the answers. You're trying to show that you really understand at the deepest level where these answers are all coming from, right? So the more you can derive and present and walk me through all the thought processes and show me what you've learned, like the better. That's, again, just to be clear to anybody who's never had me as a teacher before or whatever, just to be clear, this is a type of exam where you could literally give me every single answer correct. And that does not mean you get a hundred on the exam. Like there are, there have been some unfortunate incidents in the past where people did give me all correct answers and they did really badly because it's not about that. And then they thought I was accusing them of cheating and all this stuff. Like we're not getting into that. We're getting into <laughs> that it's a presentation. You're anytime you think, wait, does he want me to show this? The answer is yes. So anyway, but but you have to be proportional. You show me every big idea once, and then you refer back to it in, in the, um, at the end. And, you know, some ideas you spend more time on than others. I'm making that mistake right now. Um, so then the person asked me in direct chat, though, and this is about questions. Someone asked me, wait, what do I mean? What does this mean? When I wrote this a second ago, What that means, and I called it part C of what I was just asking you to note. In English, what that says is, Okay. And, and, you know, this type of like one sentence was essentially what you would tell me. I'm saying, I'm, when I say, the, if I use F sub C to mean conservative force, then when I write that statement, closed path integral, of conservative force equals by definition zero. What I'm saying is that's supposed to be a definition of what it means to be a conservative force. It means a conservative force is one that does no work, no net work over any closed path. Remember this whole discussion. So like gravity is a conservative force because whatever work it does, if I throw something up and the thing falls back down, like goes up to a height H and falls back down from a height H, like whatever work gravity is doing on the way up on that thing is negative MGH. It's slowing it down, slowing it down, taking away kinetic energy, da, 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 doing negative MGH on the way up. And then the thing falls back down and gravity does positive MGH and the two add together to make a, a net amount of zero, right? Gravity does that. Friction does not do that. Tension does not do that. A conservative force is one that does zero work around a closed path. That's what that means. To, to, so now, um, I'll see if, so I'm gonna go back now. Again, this is all just examples. I ask you a question. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, so that's what like, when you draw the zero on the integral, that's what you're indicating? When I, right, when I draw the circle on the integral, what I'm indicating is that the path that the integral is looking at is a closed path, like specifically, yes, yeah, so this was in your, should I write this down? Yeah, um, I'm just questioning whether I should literally write this down. Or yeah, I'm gonna just write this. Like when I use that, because actually it's gonna come up a lot later in the class, so yeah. Sorry to be annoying, but no, no, can no. you go back to the page oh, before? When you're yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. 
So I'll say this in English while you're, um, and then I'll write it. But yes, to everybody. I'm done copying. Thank okay, you. Okay, all right, okay. So. Uh, Thank you so much. No, 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 uh, this is good. This is what we're here for today. Um, uh, 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 okay. I'm saying this. So I'm saying in general, in math, like you have definite integrals and indefinite integrals in math, right? And a definite integral means an integral from a specific boundary or limit to another specific boundary or limit. <laughs> There's something called a closed integral that you hadn't necessarily learned about in math, but it's come up in this class. There's something called a closed integral. A closed integral is a definite integral. It is a definite integral, but it's got the odd property. So it's an integral that where you're measuring from a boundary to a boundary, but the only catch of a closed integral is that the two boundaries are the same. A closed integral is you start walk, start somewhere, measure, 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 like walk away, walk away, walk away, and then come back, measure, 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 and end up at the place that you started. So it's an out plus an in is what a closed path integral means. And yeah, we're saying by that. So that's just in general, that's a concept. But then we're saying if the closed path integral of some force is zero all the time, regardless of what the size or shape of the closed path is, if the closed path integral of a force is zero, then that force is conservative. And as long as all the forces, do, and gravity is one such example, the spring is also an example. Spring is a conservative force. Gravity is a conservative force. Any other forces that we've seen so far in this class are not conservative. The next one we will see is the electrostatic force. But, okay, so now back to this thing, I'm just looking at the time. And again, hopefully I'm we're using this whole, like this little problem as an example of going through lots of aspects of the test. Like that's sort of ideally what I guess I'm doing right now. But But now to go back to the thing, uh, then, so I said like A, B, and C, I'm saying, nope, here's what you got to show. A, MG is conservative. B, like, you, oh, so one, explain how all the forces here doing work are conservative. And then two, I'll try to speed this up. Two, you should explain briefly what is meant by potential energy. Yeah, I'm not going to, you can go back and watch old videos on the hat or go over your old notes on that. I'm like, I'm sure I'm losing people because I'm so in the rabbit hole right now of this that I'm not going to do that right now. But I'm just noting to you that the more you could do a thing like that, the better your exam will be. Um, so you'll explain briefly PE, but then finally, well, and I'll just write the definition, what I mean. Yeah. Now, what, once you've explained PE, then you'll say, okay. You're going to say something like kinetic energy plus potential energy at theta naught equals kinetic energy plus potential energy at the equilibrium position. This again, this is now back to like the same thing you did in question four um, in homework one. Okay, I'm going to, again, I'm going to skip steps now. You get the idea that you want to explain everything. So now cutting to the chase, I would say one F MV squared. Oh, well, and you're going to show. Sorry. Show that for a pendulum, and you did this in lab, show that for a pendulum, um, right, Potential energy is gravitational potential energy, which for a pendulum equals this. I mean, it's MGH, but H equals L minus L cosine theta. You'll show that with a quick diagram. I'm not going to explain this. I'm just showing you what I mean. It's something like this. That's L, that's L, that's theta, and this is H. So for, again, I'm just, just so you, okay, H 
is L minus L cosine theta in a pendulum. Um, so potential energy is MgL minus L cosine theta. So you're literally saying in the energy method here, and the good news is the other one's faster, but you're going to say. Can you go back for oh, a second? Sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay, I'll pause for a second. Thank you. How do you decide which one's like which L? If that makes sense. Wait. Oh, oh, they're the same. So L means, this is part of the, um, why this works is L means the length of the string, right? So the string is always the same length. And the string is like a radius of a circle and all radii of a circle are all the same. So in other words, L, when the, when the bob is at an angle, L is that hypotenuse. But then when L swings all the way down to the bottom, like, like it, I, I'm intentionally saying that this is, well, my diagram is not very to scale, but like these are the same L and that's how you're able to, but H, the height that you want for potential energy, H is how far the thing falls from it literally vertically from where it originally was to where it ends up. So H, you're looking for this chunk right here. So the whole idea is that you can get that chunk by saying, oh, it's the difference between uh, this whole length of the string minus just this part of the string, this shorter part of the string that completes this right triangle. I don't know if I'm making sense. You, we may have, maybe we can talk about this, but L is the yeah, whole- makes sense. Oh, for real? Okay, okay. So, Thank okay. you. No problem, okay. Um, all right, so again, I want to get, so, so I'm basically saying this, I'm now sort of skipping steps. You'll have to be careful about this at home, but I'm saying the potential energy, all the energy is potential at the initial point and all of the energy, like I've crossed off, this is just like question four. Um, like there's a, one term got crossed off on one side and one term got crossed on the other side. Now I can cross off the M's, right? So I'm almost there. So, so V, well, so one half V squared equals G L one cosine theta. And so V equals the square root of 2GL1 cosine theta. G is the number that you got above. It was something like 1.65 or something like that. L was given in the problem as six. Theta is given in the problem as like pi over uh, 10 or something like that. Uh, it's, it's whatever the initial, yeah, pi over 10. Okay, so I, I'm not... Because we have seven minutes, or no, so, oh, we have 17 minutes. But nonetheless, for the moment, I'm not going to do the calculation. I'm just going to, you can do that. Like you can plug in the numbers. But this is one method for getting V, right? So you plug in the numbers. That would be one method for getting V. And again, notice sort of the catch of all this is you had to have figured out G in order to do this because you don't know it. Now you go to the other method for finding. I'm just looking at the chat. Okay, you go to the other method for finding V and compare the two answers.
Okay, so the first thing I'm saying is, once we know that something is a harmonic oscillator, once we know the differential equation applies to it, then we know the solution to that differential equation is the cosine function, right? Now, this part, you so, so we know that this pendulum, but if we were to make a graph or whatever of this bob going, if we were to make a graph of the position of this bob, the theta, it would be a cosine graph. The you know the bob is in time. It's at big cosines and then small cosine. Not that sorry. It's at big angles and then small angles and then big angles. Right. So if you made a graph, the angles are going up and down and up and down. It's going back and forth and back and forth like a mass on a spring in the manner of so theta equals initial theta times cosine of omega t. Uh, and that, all that math, you do need to show somewhere in the exam, but you've presumably already shown it in part one of problem one. Um, so you can say that. But so now we know that theta equals theta naught of cosine omega t. I'm just writing it again. And by definition, what do we mean by theta? I mean, theta, we mean the angular position of this pendulum bob. But what do we mean by that? This whole, all of this harmonic oscillation and everything is forcing us to really get our mind around angles. And we remember, we think of an angle as a portion or a fraction of a circle. An angle is a portion of a circle, meaning by definition, This is the definition of an angle, particularly measured in radians, right? It's like arc length divided by radius. We've, I, I'm going to beat a dead horse. I mean, that's like very important to this class. But I've tried to explain it, but I keep ending up explaining it the exact same way. So I'm going to beat a dead horse if I try again. But, the, but it, you know, it's how much of the crust of a pizza you get per size of pizza right it's how much of the circle you go around but just divided by radius so that we don't fool ourselves so that so that a fourth of a pizza of this size is a fourth of a pizza is a 90 degree angle and a fourth of a pizza this size is a fourth of a pizza it's a 90 degree angle we don't want um we want a 90 degree angle to be a 90 degree angle no matter how big the circle is that's the point so whatever amount of arc length you get for that section or circle you then divide out by the radius and that makes the definition of an angle now why am i bringing that up that's the definition of angle it's arc length per radius well um if theta is theta naught cosine omega t and if theta equals x over r that means x equals r times theta. So I can rewrite this theta function. I can I can multiply both sides by r and say x equals r theta naught cosine omega t, right? Now, why would I do that? That's a weird thing to do. I, in other words, theta is measuring, sorry, theta is the angular position of the bob at any given moment in time, the angular position where it is in its, you know, is it, is it, is it 90 degrees from vertical or is it at vertical, whatever, but I just converted, I just rewrote that to be measuring literally how many meters the pendulum moves in space. Like I just changed angular position to linear position. Why would I do that? Because we know that V, instantaneous velocity, in this case, instantaneous speed, the thing we're looking for is by definition, the instantaneous rate of change of position. Like V is the derivative of X with respect to T. Now notice, and I'm almost done, but just notice like, so basically what I'm just saying is, oh, the other way of getting V is just take a derivative. This is gonna be a lot faster than all the energy stuff I did first, okay? This is a lot faster. I'm saying to get V, to get velocity, just take a derivative. Only the one subtlety is take derivative of position. V is by definition derivative of position, like standard X position on an, on an axis, on a, you know what I'm saying. 
V is derivative of X over T. It's not the derivative of theta over T. So we have to make this one adjustment and multiply theta by R. Now we're measuring X. So we can take the derivative and pardon me for one second. I will do, oh, sorry. I'll just leave that so you can copy. Hold on. I'll take the derivative and then we'll be done with that. Hold on. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take the derivative. Uh, right. So I'm going to, so I'm taking the derivative. Well, I'm saying V. Oh, equals the, right. And X equals. So how do we take the derivative of that? We do like always, the trigonometric derivative and um, chain rule. So we go negative R omega, theta, I mean, the theta uh, naught times omega from the chain rule. You might want to explain that. Well, you probably, you, you might, you probably explained that earlier in the exam. So we get that right now, and we're just about done. Um, um, but Sorry, I'm distracted. Uh, we're just about done. Now, at other places in the exam, you would now take another derivative, right? We tend to take two derivatives because we tend to be looking at acceleration and the differential equation and all that. But that's not the deal here. Here, we are just interested in V. So we got what we wanted. We took one derivative. Um, um, we got one derivative and that's what we need. So, and we have all the values. Six theta no, is pi over 10. I'm not going to do the math now. You can totally do that. But we have uh, omega was, was pi over six, I believe. Oh, but I will warn you. And omega, and that's that same omega, pi over six. Oh, uh, and what is T? T, it told you for this, this is, t, it's a quarter of the period. And you've gotten the period from above, or at least you can get it. Okay, I'm going to pause. But so that, and then you compare and it, it will work if you do it correctly. And it'll be satisfying after all that work. If you get the same answer for V in this method as you did in the other method, then you say the two answers match. This works. End of story. Now we have seven minutes more. I'm going to look in the chat. I will say, I know that was a long walk, what I just did. But again, I want to thank the person that asked for that. Like that was like the perfect level of specificity in a weird way. Because I honestly think, even if you like spaced out during everything I just said, if you look, you know, as long as you now have the notes, that problem embodies kind of, or that part embodies like all the issues, almost all of the issues that you're responsible for in the exam that are not covered in depth in the other videos. Okay. So, I mean, obviously, I encourage watching all the videos. And again, Again, the idea is I know that you know that I know that you have all the answers and that I'm walking you through all this. Also, let me please remind you, especially if you haven't had me uh, you know, before as a teacher, this is totally open source, open universe exam, right? Like it's understood that you, it's hoped that you'd be consulting all of your notes, your past videos, your, and your friends. Like I want you to help one another work on this. I do. And that's not a joke. And it's not because I'm an idiot. Like maybe I am an idiot, but that's not the reason for this. 
the idea to reinforce is that we both basically what I, I'm telling you that anything that you normally think of as cheating is okay on the, that you normally think of as cheating is okay on this exam. And the reason for that, again, is what I actually believe is cheating is when one person tries to get an edge that someone else wouldn't have because the other person is like following ethics and moral. Like when one person does something that moral people or ethical people or people following the rules wouldn't do, but one person does. What I think cheating is, is getting an unfair advantage, taking advantage of other people's like respect for a system and just grabbing something for yourself that they don't have. To me, that is cheating. So if we all have, and I also think it's whatever. So if we're all living in a world now that has the web and all that, where answers are everywhere, my point is let's live in that world. You have all the answers. You have all the information. You can watch as many videos from past classes as you want, and you should all help each other. And then as long as we all know that, then the playing field is level and no one has an unfair advantage, as far as I can tell, hope. But then we all know that we all know that so what you're trying to do on this exam is show me how much you've done with all that information. You're trying to show me that now you've taken all that information from your friends, from your videos, from the classes, and you've processed them through your personal understanding. So you're then delivering me your thorough personal understanding of how all of this works, right? I, oh, I, I remember now, I've already said this in this class, like you're writing an essay in a foreign language to show that you've developed fluency in that language. And just remember that anybody who does speak that language, physics can tell, right? Now, that said, that said, um, I, I think between all these videos, you've got like full help on all the problems. Problem four, right? Problem four, if I ask you to do that, the whole thing of like show that a wave is a bunch of staggered oscillators, that there's no, I don't know if the, there's probably old videos on that you can find, but explicitly that's the class notes from last week. Like last week, what we did in class that's what you want to understand in order to answer question four. Okay. So I think every other question has been, I think, um, you know, addressed. Oh, wait, and there's something in the, oh, and, and last piece of advice. We still have three minutes. I'll see before I forget. And I'll look in the chat. Therefore, another way in terms of pro tips, like what separates like a really good exam, you know, exam that does really well from another one, you're three things. You're trying to give me a document that you're trying to give me a document that stands on its own, that is self-sufficient physics, i.e. anybody who knows physics but doesn't know this exam or doesn't remember this exam or has so many things to grade that they can't remember this exam. You're trying to give me a document that stands on its own that's just like, here is this physics. If I'm given this situation with this pendulum and I'm trying to figure out what the velocity is at the equilibrium, here's all the work I do to figure that out. Like you walk me through from the beginning to the end of every single problem and make it as inviting and clear and easy for me to follow your work. You want to give me a presentation that I literally don't, that I can grade, that I can follow and mark, or that Professor Walters or anybody who knows physics could follow, not that they're going to, but could follow and mark without even looking at the exam. The less I can turn to other things while I'm looking at your thing, and the more I'm brought in, and the more you're making it clear at every moment, this is where I am, this is what I'm doing, here's a picture, here's a different color, here's my thought bubble. Like, it is a presentation. Just suck me in and make me want to read your exam and make it an easy experience, right? And walk me through everything. That's So number one is that it's self-sufficient. Number two is that it's actually clear and easy to follow. Number three, I know we have one more minute, and I will look at the chat. Number three, one thing that will really separate the wheat from the chaff, somehow or another, give yourself at least enough time to do a rough draft and then a final draft. I know some of us always do that and some of us never do that. Try to be a person who does that. Like, it, right? Think Again, think of this as a presentation, not as do it early enough that you can then sit and you get my point, make a final draft. So, all right, let me look at the chat. 
Oh, oh, good, good. Okay, okay. Uh, you're welcome. I mean, someone just thanked me. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so yeah, hopefully this is all helpful. Again, it'll be posted at 8 p.m. Oh, and last thing too, especially if you don't know me. The last thing is, I'm very loose about homeworks and all that. You still can turn in old homeworks later for more points or revisions or late, and I still owe you stuff. That's all fine, but I can't. But I don't be fooled and don't be confused. With exams, we have to be on time. You have to deliver this thing electronically before 8 a.m. on Tuesday, and then you have to show up. Well, and then you have to show up to class, which we will have physically. You have to, showing up to class is, is, it's as though it's an exam day. Like you deliver it electronically, but then you show up because that shows your colleagues that you're not at home still working on it, which otherwise they would think is unfair. Like, and they'd be right. And if you are, if you, and you will get doc points if it comes in late without any explanation. If you have a crisis, communicate with me in advance. We might be able to work it out if you communicate in advance. But if the thing just comes in late, there will be consequences because it's not fair to your colleagues. Okay. Okay. But, but I'm sure you'll do great. So, and I'm very excited. I, I won't be, I'll like hang out for a second if there's any more questions, but have a great day. Thank you for rolling with all this. Um, yes. Yes, have a good day. Have a good day. Okay. Hold on a second. Wait, and I'll turn off the recording in a second. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. I really appreciate you explaining that question. Have a good day. Wait, I'm going to turn off the recording.